I have written another article for New Eastern Outlook. It is this article here, Space-Based Warfare, America's Dominance Challenged. And as I usually do, I'm going to read this article for people who don't have the time or feel like reading it themselves, and I will add in additional information as necessary. And I think this is a very important topic, not, not covered often enough by enough analysts out there. Space-based military capabilities are clearly very central to success on the battlefield here on Earth. Space-based capabilities in general are very important to the economic prospects of nations around the globe. So it is a topic that we should understand. We should understand the key developments that are enabling space-based capabilities and how the balance of power may tip in the future. So let me begin. I will describe the battlefield above. The United States had throughout the Cold War and within the first decade of the 21st century established dominance in terms of space-based military capabilities, including satellite navigation through its global positioning system and a wide array of reconnaissance and communication satellites. These enabled US forces to access targeting data and coordinate their forces anywhere on Earth. Satellite navigation has resulted in an array of GPS guided munitions, including the 155 millimeter Excalibur artillery shell, the guided multiple launch rocket system or Gimlers. These are rockets fired by the HIMARS and M270 platforms. We have seen these in action in Ukraine and the joint direct attack munition or JDAM. This is a, a guided bomb dropped via warplanes, US warplanes. Longer range precision guided weapons using both GPS and a process called digital scene matching area correlator utilize images provided by reconnaissance satellites to find targets, obtain specific coordinates, and to guide the munitions themselves. So besides GPS, using satellite navigation to guide a weapon to a specific set of coordinates here on Earth, you can use these other processes as well. One of them involves using reference pictures taken by reconnaissance satellites and the munition has the ability to look down at the ground and to match it up with the, the photos and its database. And this is what it uses to guide itself to the target, which means it can circumvent uh, electronic warfare strategies that target GPS, for example. Such weapons were used in various US wars from the 1990s onward to great effect. And we're talking about the, the Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm in the 1990s, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the ongoing occupation from that point onward, NATO's military intervention in Libya, the ongoing conflict in Syria, and now, of course, uh, what is now taking place in Ukraine. But as you can see, the degree of success the US enjoyed using these weapons has steadily declined over time. We will get into that here. While the Soviet Union created its own satellite navigation system, the Global Navigation Satellite System, or GLONASS, uh, which the Russian Federation still employs, the use of this system for guiding weapons was not widespread until relatively recently. Large-scale use has only been observed in Syria from 2015 onward and most recently in the special military operation unfolding in Ukraine. Soviet and Russian reconnaissance satellites based on publicly available information have been employed in far fewer numbers than their American counterparts based on what you can find in, in the Western media regarding Soviet and Russian reconnaissance satellites. It appears there are a small number of them, but if they're launching them secretly, how would the US know for sure how many they actually have had or have? And the same can go for US capabilities. And while both the US and Russia have communication satellites, the US is the only nation with a low Earth orbit, or LEO, internet constellation Starlink, which consists of over 6,000 satellites. So let's, let's go over the different orbits. This is a typical low Earth orbit. These are satellites, for example, 
satellites, they take images, high resolution images of the, the planet's surface. And these are images you would see used by Google Earth or commercial imaging satellites that we see being used in the conflict in Ukraine. And as you can see, as the Earth turns, they're passing over each, each orbit, they're passing over a different spot of the Earth. And it might take hours, days, or even weeks to pass over the, for a, the same satellite to pass over the same spot on Earth. If you have more satellites, then you have more satellites that are available to pass over the same parts of the Earth more frequently. Then we have medium Earth orbit, and a lot of the satellite navigation systems are placed in this orbit. As you can see, they move. There's a constellation of them. And as the Earth turns and as they complete their orbit, you will have several that are visible at any given time. This is how you triangulate your position on, on Earth using satellite navigation. And then we have geosynchronous orbit. This is the highest orbit. And as you can see, as it is orbiting the Earth, it is stationary relative to a single spot on Earth. And so a lot of communication satellites or satellite TV use these type of satellites. They're always overhead all the time in the same position. This is what allows you to point your satellite dish up at it. Uh, Starlink works in a little bit of a different way. You point your satellite dish up, but that is because there are so many Starlink satellites passing over at any given time. You're trying to communicate with as many as you can that are flying overhead. So this is what Starlink looks like. Each one of these dots represents a Starlink satellite. As you can see, there are many, many of them. They are in low Earth orbit. So when a signal is sent from Earth to the satellite and then back down to somewhere else on Earth, the amount of time that signal travels is much shorter. The, the speed is much quicker than if you were sending a signal all the way up to a geosynchronous uh, orbit satellite and then back down somewhere on Earth. Which is why when you watch news feeds from countries using geosynchronous orbit satellites to communicate with someone else somewhere else on Earth, there's always a very long delay because even though the signals are traveling uh, around the speed of light, it's still, it's still going to be a delay traveling that amount of distance. If you have satellites closer to the Earth in low Earth orbit, and you have a lot of them, even though they are constantly moving in relationship to the surface of the Earth, there's so many of them, you can always stay in touch with a, a satellite flying over your head at any given moment. And because they are closer to the Earth, the latency is lower, the delay in communications and the transmission of information is much lower. That is the whole concept of Starlink in the United States. Because of SpaceX, it's the only country right now with a satellite network with this level of complexity and capability. Other nations, of course, are thinking about building their own constellations. Starlink provides low latency internet connections anywhere on Earth. For military forces using Starlink, it not only enables troops to communicate with each other, it also allows you to access the internet no matter where you are. On Earth, as long as you can communicate, make a connection with the Starlink satellite constellation overhead, but also to guide remote controlled platforms like aerial and maritime drones far beyond what traditional transmitted radio signals could achieve. Such drones would only be limited in range by their fuel or electric charge as long as a connection with Starlink was maintained. So this is how the Ukrainians, for example, are able to use maritime drones uh, supposedly, allegedly based out of Odessa, and they can travel far beyond the range of radio transmitted signals. They're connecting to Starlink, and the signal is going up. The, the information, the orders, the commands to the drone are going up to Starlink and then down to wherever this drone is, which is also connected to Starlink. That is how they're able to do that. That is what Starlink enables. While this has provided the U.S. and its allies with advantages, even on today's battlefield, these advantages have been countered and similar capabilities are being developed by not only Russia, but also China. So let's talk a little bit about the countermeasures. And if you have been following my updates about the conflict in Ukraine, you would, you'll be very familiar with a lot of these developments. Such U.S. weapons 
had until recently defined modern combat, leading many Western analysts into believing the US and its allies enjoyed unparalleled advantages on the battlefield. While the Soviet Union and initially the Russian Federation did not prioritize the production of precision-guided weapons using space-based capabilities, both recognized the danger of US NATO weapons using these capabilities and invested heavily in countermeasures. This has resulted in the creation of Russia's modern air and missile defense systems, as well as a variety of electronic warfare capabilities, both of which are considered some of the best in the world, and that's even according to Western analysts. In Ukraine, Western analysts predicted the transfer of US-made GPS-guided weapons to Ukrainian forces would be game changers. After just weeks of use, many of these weapons were rendered ineffective because of either Russia's ability to intercept them or jam their GPS signal, causing them to miss their target. And some Russian electronic warfare capabilities are able to confuse or disarm the fuse mechanisms in, in some US weapons, according to recent articles coming out of the Western media. So I have a couple of these. Uh, you may be familiar with this one from May 2023. Russia's jamming of U.S. provided rocket systems complicates U Ukraine's war effort. This was about HIMARS. Then we have this one. Russia jamming leaves some high-tech U.S. weapons ineffective in Ukraine. And CNN in its May 2023 article titled Russia's jamming of U.S. provided rocket systems complicates Ukraine's war effort would report on HIMARS launched Gimlers missing their targets due to Russian electronic warfare. The Washington Post in its May 2024 article titled Russian jamming leaves some high-tech U.S. weapons ineffective in Ukraine would likewise report other U.S. made GPS guided weapons were being jammed, including airdrop JDAMs and 155 millimeter Excalibur artillery shells. The article would note that the problem with Russian jamming became so bad and this is a quote from the article, Washington simply stopped providing Excalibur shells because of the high failure rate. Russia's ability to jam US-made GPS-guided weapons has provided a tremendous defensive capability for Russian forces. Russia also has developed and now deployed on a large scale its own satellite-guided munitions. This includes the tornado s guided rocket, that is a, an analog to say the HIMARS guided rockets, they have the Iskander ballistic missile. This is comparable to the Attackums, although it has a longer range than Attackums. A variety of longer range cruise missiles and Russia's own version of the JDAM referred to as the Fab Bomb series ranging from 250 to 3000 kilogram munitions. In addition to disrupting satellite guided munitions and countering them with its own versions of such weapons, Russia has also managed to jam Ukraine's access to US satellite communication networks. This includes SpaceX's revolutionary Starlink network, disrupted by Russian jamming, according to New York Times. That is this article here. Russia in new push increasingly disrupts Ukraine's Starlink service. Russia has deployed advanced tech to interfere with Elon Musk's satellite internet service, Ukrainian officials said, leading to more outages on the northern front battle line. Not only did the New York Times describe the disruption of Ukraine's use of Starlink, it also reported that Russia was coming into possession of its own Starlink terminals, allowing Russian forces to enjoy many of the advantages Ukrainian forces had. Weapons and networks, depending on U.S. space-based capabilities that were meant to be game changers, have left Ukraine at a severe disadvantage. The collective West's investment in small quantities of highly sophisticated weapons and networks came at the cost of investing sufficiently in larger quantities of cheaper weapons like artillery shells and armor, leaving Ukraine with little of either. And it turns out that not only can Russia match Western precision guided weapons, they can manufacture them in much greater quantities. While the US and Europe are attempting to rebuild their military industrial capacity to catch up with Russia and also China, in terms of these simpler but still essential weapons and munitions, Russia and China are catching up in terms of sophisticated space-based capabilities. So they, they have these precision guided weapons. What I'm referring to are the actual space-based capabilities, the satellites, the satellite constellations, and, and other capabilities that I will get into here in a moment. 
So let's talk about how Russia and China are closing that gap. Both Russia and China plan to deploy their own LEO internet constellations. Both nations also are investing in larger numbers of reconnaissance satellites. China in particular has been closing the gap with speed that has surprised the collective West. I'm going to refer to this article here. China's satellites are improving rapidly. Its army will benefit. Watch out American warships. There's many uh, articles like this out there from Newsweek. China's military satellites are watching America's every move. Defense One, Chinese satellites are breaking the US monopoly on long range targeting. I think you get the picture. The Economist, in its article, would report over the past decade, China has massively increased the number of satellites it has in operation to a total of over 600 today. Of those, more than 360 are intelligence surveillance or reconnaissance satellites, ISR satellites, which observe the Earth using sunlight, infrared waves, or reflections from radar pulses. China's ISR fleet is second in size only to America's, and its capabilities are finding appeal in the global marketplace. America recently sanctioned two Chinese firms for allegedly giving satellite images to Ukraine, of Ukraine to the Wagner Group, a Russian mercenary outfit. And of course, there are accusations that China is providing the Russian military itself with satellite imagery. The quantity and quality of Chinese satellites is improving, enabling a wide array of economic and military applications. Chinese companies providing customers with satellite imagery, just as Western-based companies do, may be allowing Russian forces to access the same up-to-date images that Ukraine is receiving, leveling the playing field in terms of ISR, but allowing Russia to leverage its advantage in vastly lar larger long-range missile and drone arsenal to better utilize the targeting data. So if both sides are getting the same amount and quality of targeting data, but Russia has far more weapons to act on that information, then you can see how Russia clearly has the advantage. While Russia has its own space-based ISR capabilities, and again, we don't really know the, to the extent to which those capabilities exist, people suspect or assume that they are far less than either the US or China, because LEO satellites taking high resolution images can only pass over an area of interest briefly and requires time to pass over the same area. Again, a process that can take hours or days depending on the satellite's specific orbit. The more satellites Russia has access to, the more frequently it can receive pictures from a specific area. So even if they have their own satellites, they have access to Chinese satellites as well. That means there's many more satellites passing over different parts of the Earth that they can collect information from more often. The Economist also talks about Chinese satellites in geostationary orbit, able to watch huge areas of the planet, including the Pacific Ocean, to track US warships and other maritime vessels in real time. Based on China's rapidly growing space-based capabilities, The Economist concludes uh, that, and this is a quote, the result might be an era of mutually assured vulnerability in space, meaning the US no longer has a monopoly in space. They had a monopoly, they no longer have a monopoly. And we've seen US and in general Western monopolies over technology, economic and military power being undermined and then eventually just disappearing altogether. This not only includes space-based capabilities aiding warfare on Earth, but also capabilities able to target other nations' space-based capabilities in orbit. So we're talking about military warfare up in space, in orbit, over the Earth, around the Earth. The US, Russia, and China have all conducted demonstrations of anti-satellite missiles launched from either aircraft or from the planet's surface. And this could be from a ground-based weapon system or from a ship. Uh, they successfully destroyed old dysfunctional satellites of each respective nation. So the US would have an old satellite of theirs that was going to deorbit and disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere they would take these anti-satellite missiles to test them. They would target the satellite, fire the missile at it, and destroy it. And Russia and China have also conducted tests like this, targeting their own respective dysfunctional uh, 
decommissioned satellites. Additionally, the U.S. has developed the X-37, an unmanned space plane launched into orbit for hundreds of days at a time, capable of changing its orbit several times during a single mission and returning to Earth where it is refurbished and launched again. While the space plane's missions are classified, it is speculated that it would be possible to inspect satellites or other of other nations and even carry weapons capable of disabling or destroying targeted satellites. The US is not the only nation with such capabilities. China's reusable experimental spacecraft is likewise capable of being launched, maintained in orbit for long periods of time, changing its orbit and carrying uh, a variety of payloads before returning to Earth where it is refurbished and reused. In theory, it should be capable of performing any mission the US X-37 can so that that was a capability the the u.s had and only the u.s had that now china has matched let's talk about one of the most important factors that will tip the balance of power in orbit one way or the other and that is reusable launch systems the u.s has a huge advantage in this but almost accidentally, I will, I will explain. Russia or China's ability to fully close the gap with the United States depends on several key capabilities, all of which the US possesses solely because of SpaceX, a relatively new company outcompeting America's traditional aerospace giants, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, and their joint United Launch Alliance, or ULA. SpaceX's success stems from the purpose-driven philosophy of the company focused on making human civilization multiplanetary. In pursuit of this goal, SpaceX has revolutionized reusable rockets, driving costs down significantly while allowing a much greater launch cadence per year. So SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, if you have followed the company from the very beginning, Elon Musk is obsessed with the idea of making human civilization multiplanetary, meaning humans are not just confined to Earth. They have the ability to stretch out across the solar system to Mars, so that would make us multiplanetary. And of course, with, with this type of access to space, you'd be able to build permanent habitats in space, which is a whole nother topic that maybe I'll get into in the future in depth. But that, that is an obsession that Elon Musk has. And when he talks about SpaceX and its mission, you can tell that this is a genuine passion of his. He is running SpaceX to achieve this purpose. Yes, SpaceX needs to make money. It needs profits to continue operating, but it is making profits to achieve this purpose. Whereas Boeing and Lockheed Martin and their United Launch Alliance exist solely to make profits and purpose, the purpose of building rockets and having a launch capability that is secondary to maximizing profits. SpaceX, wanting to increase access to orbit and beyond, Earth orbit and beyond, invested heavily in making rockets reusable. They knew that this was a, a key capability that would enable the purpose of SpaceX, making human civilization multiplanetary. They knew that was a, a prerequisite, so they invested their money into research and development. And that is what allowed them to create this revolutionary reusable rocket system. Uh, there, there was no reason for United Launch Alliance to, to create a system like this because they existed to maximize profit by investing in a reusable launch system that would then make launching into orbit cheaper they would be diverting money that would normally go to maximizing profits into research and development and then they would be developing a launch platform that would make them less money in the future so you, you can see why they wouldn't go for that and you could see how a company that is involved in cutting edge technology space travel essentially, how regressive they became in pursuit of profits and how SpaceX turned that around. And a lot of people say that SpaceX is part of the deep, deep state, it serves the deep state, it obviously performs contracts for the US government because it is a US based company. But if you have followed it from the very beginning, you will, you will have realized that in the very beginning, the US government and 
people in Congress under the influence of, say, Boeing and Lockheed Martin actually tried to block SpaceX from getting those contracts in the first place. So SpaceX had to fight for its survival. If, if it was up to United Launch Alliance alone, if SpaceX hadn't fought uh, to, to remain in existence, they would have gotten rid of SpaceX. And now the US has these incredible capabilities that they like to showcase to the world and claim are a, an example of US innovation, technological innovation, when actually it's an anomaly. Boeing and Lockheed Martin are actually better representations of the current state of US innovation. I get into all of that in, in the article. I'm going on a tangent here. SpaceX's success stems from the purpose-driven philosophy of the company focused on making human civilization multiplanetary. In pursuit of this goal, SpaceX has revolutionized reusable rockets, driving costs down significantly while allowing a much greater launch cadence per year. Its Falcon 9 rockets launch payloads into orbit with the first stage booster returning to Earth under the power of its own rocket engines. The booster is recovered, checked, and can be returned to flight as quickly as one week. This is absolutely unprecedented. There is no other company or government in the world capable of doing this right now, only SpaceX. China is now conducting over 60 orbital launches a year. In the year 2020 and 2021, China conducted more launches than the United States. But because of the success and expanded use of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket family, the US has since conducted more launches in 2022 and 2023 and is expected to outpace China this year as well. The ability to quickly and cheaply launch payloads into orbit allows SpaceX to build its Starlink constellation. It also allows the US and other customers to launch satellites almost on demand. In a future conflict where satellites are being disabled or destroyed by adversaries, this capability would allow the US to replace satellites as quickly as they could be built or as quickly as essential satellites held in strategic storage can be prepared and integrated with the Falcon 9 rocket. So say the US attacks GLONASS and China's navigational uh, satellite navigation constellation and China and Russia attacked America's GPS network, the US could send GPS satellites back into orbit very quickly because of SpaceX's Falcon 9. This is a capability both Russia and China currently lack. Reusability is key to achieving the launch cadence and capability SpaceX affords the US government. Both Russia and China are developing reusable rockets. Russia's Amur rocket, visually similar to SpaceX's Falcon 9, is still years away from its first test flight. China, on the other hand, has a large number of both state-owned enterprises and private companies developing rockets, including reusable systems. In June 2024, so just last month, the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology, a subsidiary of China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASIC, performed a 12-kilometer test flight of a reusable 3.8-meter diameter first-stage booster. So this is something close to the size of, uh, or at least the diameter, of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. The test flight of a full-scale launch vehicle is scheduled for next year. So this is happening very rapidly in China. If they are able to develop their own equivalent of a Falcon 9 rocket, and people will claim that these are just ripoffs of SpaceX's Falcon 9. They aren't. They use entirely different types of rocket engines, different fuel. It looks similar to a Falcon 9 the same way an Airbus looks similar to a Boeing, because planes need a fuselage, wings, and landing gear. To, to fly, it's just a matter of physics and reusable rockets are going to look similar. They're going to have retractable legs. It's the most effective way with the, the technology we as human civilization have at our disposal. Uh, it's the, the most efficient way we can do this with the technology we have. And so it's going to look similar whether it's made by a US-based company, Chinese-based or Russian-based company. The capability SpaceX provides the US government are the result of a systemic anomaly 
This was what I was trying to explain before. The U.S. government and the special interests that dominate foreign and domestic policy are motivated by the accumulation of wealth and power. Lockheed, Boeing, and their joint United Launch Alliance represent a more accurate picture of typical contemporary American innovation and progress. ULA launched only three rockets last year. Three. Three rockets. SpaceX scores and scores of rockets. And ULA's rockets are not reusable. They use them once and everything gets thrown away and they have to build a, an, another rocket from scratch. The enterprise maximizes profit by avoiding investment in the sweeping innovation SpaceX has pursued. SpaceX's rapid innovation cannot be replicated across the rest of US industry precisely because SpaceX is purpose-driven while the vast majority of US industry is profit-driven. This is a very important concept to understand, profit versus purpose. It is because of that, should China maintain a purpose-driven policy and industry, it will eventually close the gap between itself and the US in terms of space-based capabilities before the gap begins to grow, but this time in China's favor. China's mix of private and state-owned enterprises coupled with a purpose-driven political system has already demonstrated its ability to close industrial and technological gaps in everything from semiconductor production, electric vehicles and smartphones, to shipbuilding, missiles, and trains. And in some of these categories, China has vastly surpassed the United States. Should China master reusable rockets, placing vast constellations of satellites into orbit, mirroring Starlink, being able to replace satellites as quickly as they can be built and or integrated with a launch vehicle, and any other critical capability required in orbit above the economies and battlefields of Earth, all of this will be well within China's reach. So again, if they're able to master reusable rockets like SpaceX has, then all, all of this will be within reach of China, probably much more because they will be working with a purpose-driven government. A purpose-driven industry together with a purpose-driven government can achieve much more than SpaceX by itself being driven by a specific purpose surrounded by a system that is profit-driven. Just as American dominance has eroded elsewhere across economic and military domains, its dominance in space may be short-lived. As long as the United States pursues unsustainable hegemony above all other nations, rather than finding a constructive role to play among all other nations, it will continue to suffer from the misallocation of resources, both financial and human, while Russia, China, and the rest of the multi-world continue to expand both here on Earth and above it. And that is the article. And I just want to point out that as far-fetched as it seems, humanity's future really is not just here on Earth, but above it and beyond it. This, this is the future of the human race, human civilization. There are finite resources here on Earth. There are many more resources beyond Earth. And if we had the technology to access and exploit them, we could expand human civilization uh, in, in ways unimagined before. And we, we could do it with tremendous abundance because of technology. And so this is what we here on Earth should be working towards, a, a better and brighter future, a, a future, a very specific vision of the future driven by technological progress rather than the empty, meaningless, rhetorical platitudes that we always hear from Western leaders. We, we should have a clear vision of what it is we want to do here on Earth and beyond it to make human civilization better. And rather than fighting over limited resources, using technology to make resources unlimited or using technology to access for what is in all intents and purposes unlimited resources beyond Earth. Uh, so all of this is possible if we want to make it possible. We, we have already by far surpassed all natural limitations our, our personal biology imposes on us. As, as a species, our ability to reason and innovate have allowed us to flourish in ways nature never intended. What, what limit is there to our ability to flourish except the limits we place on ourselves? So maybe there is some 
hidden optimism in all of this, even as we talk about warfare uh, on Earth and above it. I will probably get into this topic again, I hope relatively soon. Maybe we can talk about some of those more optimistic aspects of uh, living and working in orbit around Earth and beyond it. Uh, until then, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. Highly suggest people follow me on Telegram. Absolutely everything is posted there. Articles that I, I cannot post on X. Uh, backups of all of my videos that I put on YouTube, but I'm also now uploading all of my videos to Rumble as well. So check that out in the video description below. Also in the video description are all of the links to everything I referenced in this video, as well as the article that I read, this article I wrote for New Eastern Outlook. And in the video description below are ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize any of the social media platforms that I am on. If commercials, ads pop up, feel free to skip past them. If you do want to help support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's a one-time donation or donations month to month, or if you have no extra resources and you're just helping share my work with others, helping get this information out to more people, all of that is greatly appreciated. That is what makes this work possible. That is what makes this work effective. So thank you, and as always, thank you for watching.